Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry Bearden. I am the project director of the organizational capacity building uh, department here at the National Community Action Partnership. And so I'd like to welcome you to webinar Wednesday. Our topic today is analysis of data, some examples to explore. And uh, to lead us in this webinar, uh, we have with us Dr. Barbara Mooney who is the director of the Association of Nationally Certified Roma Trainers, as well as Ms. Carrie Gibson, uh, who is the deputy director. So I am going to turn things over to their very capable hands, and we'd like to encourage you to uh, enter any comments or questions in the chat, and I will be uh, prepared to help uh, share the information and those questions with our presenters today. So with that, thank you very much, Barbara and Carrie. Let's get things going. Great, thank you, Terry. Uh, and hopefully everyone uh, can see my screen, Barbara and Terry, if y'all can give me a thumbs up, I'll at least know that, that someone can, perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon or good morning, uh, wherever it is uh, that y'all are joining us from today. So we uh, have a really fun topic uh, for Webinar Wednesday today. We're gonna talk about analysis of data. Uh, and so as you probably saw in the description when you uh, were thinking about signing up for today, um, you know, this idea of, of data analysis is a topic that continues to rise to the top. Every time uh, a survey goes out um, from you know, any of our, our partners in the network, uh, responses come back and say, you know, we, we really wanna know more around how do we actually analyze all of this data that we're collecting and reporting. So we've got uh, some overview just about some things for analysis that might be helpful to consider. And then at the end, we're gonna go through uh, some examples that we've actually pulled from the field. Uh, and Barbara and I are gonna do a little brainstorming and we welcome your participation in the chat uh, to help us out with that as well. Um, so hope that you uh, will enjoy the material today. Um, so of course, just setting the context, you know, uh, grounding ourselves, uh, looking at the Roma cycle. And many of you all I saw when I was looking at the at the participants, it looks like we've got a lot of Roma professionals on the call today. So that's really great. Um, but for those of you maybe that are newer to our network, not quite as familiar with uh, our performance management framework, when we talk about being results oriented, what we're really doing is we're saying, you know, what our basic assumption about our work is that the services that we provide, the strategies that we engage in, we assume that by doing those things, that that's going to lead to a positive or even a neutral change, but, but hopefully a change in condition or status for the better. When we talk about ROMA, which is our performance management framework in the community action world, you know, this idea of results oriented management and accountability. So the management part of that cycle is where we're thinking about identifying uh, those, those actions that we're gonna take, monitoring those services and strategies. It's our system for how we're gonna do the work that we do. And then the accountability part of the cycle is where we think about how did we, how do we know what we did? What did we document? What was our process for collecting and measuring that data and then sharing the impact of our efforts? Um, so we really wanna make sure that we're always rooted in this idea of a results orientation, that everything that we do should be moving us to that position of being able to bring about a change. Um, this is the PEAK uh, framework uh, that OCS uh, introduced. Um, gosh, Barbara, when did they first, when was the PEAK brought up? The, uh, October at the uh, NASCAS conference is the first okay. that was publicly uh, shared. Great. So just want to bring this and put this in front of you all. Um, maybe you've seen it before, maybe not, but, but looking at the language here. So performance, evaluation, accountability, accessibility, making that story known, making the, C the CSBG story available, and then knowledge. How well do you actually know your CSBG story? How do you know the impact of your work? And so part of this idea of making our story available means that we've got to collect data 
but not just any data. We've got to collect the right data. And then we have to analyze that data so that we turn it in from into information so that it can help us tell that story uh, and help us be able to share the impact of what we've done um, across the across the country. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Barbara and she's going to get us started uh, going into some of our details for today. So just a, a quick follow up to that uh, uh, introduction to the peak framework. Uh, this is a build on to the framework that was introduced during the modernization period, I like to call it from 2015 to 2017, when the network was looking at all of the elements of a performance management system and creating the organizational standards and the process. So that framework has now been expanded on. And I was talking to somebody today uh, who said, remind everyone that we are in charge of our story. We control our story. And so I think that's important, not only how well you know, but the, the understanding that we're in control. So we're going to use data to tell our story. So the next couple of slides is just a really brief review of things you already know, but we wanted to make sure we were grounded before we got into the examples. So um, when we talk about data, we talk about uh, distinct object, uh, objects like numbers or responses, but not just that they are a set of objects, but also that there's a purpose for them. So click again to bring that. That, that these facts can be used for a practical purpose. That's part of what we mean when we talk about data. And um, it can be qualitative or quantitative. And we just have a couple examples here. I think this is, um, you're, we're singing to the choir here. So um, the, the, the language, the letters, and it talks about the depth and breadth of issues. Um, it can be from groups of people or from individuals. It can be from notes that are that are dropped off uh, in your box uh, at work. Uh, it can be interviews. Um, so it's that communication with people. That's data. Don't forget that that's data. That's important data. Sometimes we only look at the quantitative data, and you know that's the numbers, the facts, the statistics, um, the charts and the graphs um, that show things that. We'll have a lot more of that in our examples, but we want to make sure the qualitative uh, is important. So um, Lee Shore always used to say, no stories without data, no data without stories. And so this come, goes together and just, just reminding us all that that's true. And that when we have those, those data elements, that that's raw, unprocessed data and in order for it to become useful to us, we have to analyze the data. Um, and you've heard, you've seen this, you might have seen this before, but it's, it's kind of a progression of, uh, we turn data into information when we analyze it in some fashion. So the raw data is what we observe or measure, but uh, it only becomes knowledge when we add some of our own uh, uh, information to the data, we, we have data information and then we have that interacting with what we know with our experiences. So we have a little example here of uh, the mountain. Uh, we're looking at what's the, what's the, what are the facts about how, how tall it is, where it is, what kind of climate it has. Uh, that's the raw facts. But we combine that together to understand the conditions on the mountain. But it only becomes knowledge once we take that information and we relate it to what we know about the task of climbing and survival. So um, it's a matter of we want to get to knowledge. And, um, and that's why it's important for us to think about that last part of the peak framework. We want to get to the knowledge piece. I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah, sure. So we, uh, this is not a, a graphic that is uh, new. This is something that we bring out because I think it, it's impactful in that it gives you a visual, a, a way to think about how do we actually start 
to turn this data into information. So some people think about this as a funnel. I like to think about it like a blender. So when we're thinking about, you know, making a smoothie, you've got all these separate ingredients on their own, they may be great, but when you pull them together, now you've really got something and that's what we're doing with our data. We're, we're pulling it together in a way that, that makes meaning of it. And part of data analysis involves some inspection and some cleaning of your data because this is where you're gonna start to uncover uh, some of these really um, useful pieces that you can start again to, to uh, combined with your experience so that you've got that knowledge. And we in the Community Action Network uh, should be familiar with this idea of cleaning. Uh, think about the, the cleaning memo uh, that NASCAS uh, has sent out, you know, in response to your annual report data. So sometimes they may say, oh, we see that data is missing or we see something that just looks like it's not quite in range with everything else. Can you can you tell us about this? So that that idea of cleaning up the data uh, is a part of that that data analysis. That's what helps us to take the the correct raw data so that we make good decisions. So why why do we analyze data? Why do we bother? You know, making sure that what we've reported on and collected over the year. Why do we start to look at it? Well, raw data needs to be analyzed because we need to make sure that we're removing those outliers or those obvious errors. So think about uh, the graphic that Barbara just had in front of us of, of Mount Everest. If we saw uh, that they said, oh, the temperature today there is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? Yeah, that might make us step back and go, I, I don't know this. I'm questioning the accuracy of this data. So that's why we want to make sure that that we have some elements of cleaning there. Uh, we also may have some questions about missing data. Do we have everything that we need? Um, we're going to make comparisons with that data. That's one reason why we analyze, analyze it. We also can start to, to clarify the context of the data. You know, what if there was a survey uh, and 95% uh, percent of the survey respondents said that, that cats are better than dogs. Uh, and then you looked at who actually answered the survey and it was 100% of cat owners, right? So, so you've got to take this into context when you're starting to, to make sense of the data that you've collected. Uh, and then think about who your audience is when you're, when you're sharing out your findings from the analysis. Some folks are more visual in how they can see and interpret and understand the information that you're giving them. So having a chart or a graph uh, can really make it uh, more user-friendly um, because again, we're not doing this just for the sake of doing it, we're doing it so that we can make meaning of this data so that we can make sure that we're keeping the eye on that, that overall results orientation. So there's a lot of different uh, kinds of data analysis. Uh, there, you know, there are, are masters and doctoral level programs that, that can help with this, you know, so uh, certainly, you know, data analysis, um, these are just different ways, different kinds of, of data analysis, but we're talking just sort of that bird's eye view of some more perhaps entry level ways that we can start to think about uh, the analysis of data, because we need to have a basic understanding of how we can start to dig deeper into these facts that we've collected so that we can make better decisions. Um, so anyone, you know, don't, don't want to say that, you know, um, oh, data analysis, you know, it's so easy, uh, but, but certain parts of it are very user friendly. And so oftentimes we hear folks say, oh, well, we don't have a a statistician or a, a data manager or or somebody with this you know real specialized skill set at our agency and that's okay because you can do these techniques you can aggregate the data right you're bringing it all together you're thinking about maybe uh, what bucket if you will that you want to put it in but then you can start to also do these things. And these are things that we can all do. We can all count, right? So we can say how many live, uh, for example, in a certain area. And out of that number of people, how many maybe have a certain characteristic? How many are of a certain age, uh, race, ethnicity? How many speak a certain language? What's their housing status? 
And then once we start to count, then we can start to compare. Well, hmm, what, what does this look like if we look at this count of things in comparison to, to this count over here? Are we started to see, um, you know, gosh, this looks like it's a larger impact in this area, maybe smaller over here. Are there any differences? Do we see that, that folks in one zip code are, are reporting a need that doesn't show up somewhere else? We're comparing those two things. And so when we start to do those simple things, when we count, when we compare, then that sets us up to start to identify trends. Is something getting better? Is it getting worse? Is something changing? Does that mean that our priorities then need to shift? Um, so just very, uh, very user-friendly ways. Just be curious and start playing with the data that you have and really, you know, kind of this idea of see what rises to the top. Um, but this is important. What if the data that you're analyzing is flawed? Um, think about this. Think about if you are making decisions based on the analysis of your data, if that data is flawed, that's gonna lead perhaps to a waste of time. You've spent all this time looking at this data. Uh, that's a waste of, of money, those monetary resources. It can give you a false impression. You could come away thinking that something is doing really well when in fact it's not, or you could come away thinking something's really in crisis when in fact it's okay and doesn't need your attention can lead to poor forecasts and then devalue those decisions that follow. So if Barbara and Terry and I have just been in a three hour session where we've analyzed data only to find out that that data is incorrect, all of our plans and every decision that we made based on that, it, we're gonna feel that. Think about the impact on staff morale, think about the impact on your customers, the impact on your budget and your resources, all from the analysis of data um, that was not that was not accurate. So we want to make sure that we take the time on the front end to do that cleaning, so that we're not suffering the consequences of, of flawed data uh, later on. And this is a good little cartoon. You know, this uh, column column D here is like, oh yeah, man, sorry, we just can't trust you. Column C, you know, <laughs> you, we we believed in you, but oh gosh, you've let us down. So, and we know that errors can happen, right, at any stage of the process because most of the data collection and entry that we have. It, it comes from people and guess what? People make mistakes. We make mistakes every day. Errors can occur at all part of the process. Um, maybe we're not getting data from everyone that it needs to come from, or we're getting data that's incomplete or inaccurate. Think about if you're trying to just type in the number 11 and you hit it a couple of extra times and now you've got you know 1111 what's that going to look like when you sum all of those data entries you know but these are things that can happen um, we want to make sure that we think about the errors that can occur not just with the data collection but thinking about our data storage system um, if we enter in the wrong symbol or the wrong uh, the wrong letter or number uh, is that going to cause us to maybe lose our data is it being collected in a timely manner you know timely so that it's relevant to what we need to look at and make decisions around um, and if we can't get that data thinking about the storage if there's errors in being able to retrieve the data well so what now we've got all this stuff over here that we that we don't have access to so we might as well not have it uh, at all those those mapping errors that can occur so we don't want to assume we talk a lot about making assumptions we don't want to assume that the data that we have right in front of us is correct uh, we want to make sure that it's been cleaned that it's been um, that it's been evaluated so that we can have confidence uh, in knowing that the information we're looking at um, um, is is indeed accurate. We talk about uh, four pieces of data accuracy um, or quality data rather. Is it complete, accurate, reliable, and timely? And so I think about that of, you know, that spells cart. So I'm not putting any data in my cart unless I know that it's quality data because I want to make sure that I'm then making good, good decisions based on that. Um, Barbara, do you want to talk a little bit about ice cream? <laughs> yeah, it's at, at one of our our favorite comparisons uh, that 
uh, it, it happens that the number of drownings go up at the same time that the consumption of ice cream goes up. So if you're gonna compare two things, you wanna make sure that there's a causative relationship. So in the next slide, you'll see the, the graphs. If we looked at these two graphs, we would say, oh, well, ice cream sales influence drowning or drowning influences ice cream sales, but they're both related to a third factor, which is the warm weather. And so that we always have to be thinking about that. Is what we um, have to compare uh, the right, are those the right things? Um, yeah, the, the difference between correlation and causation. And so we're going to take a, a real quick look at an example that was in the, um, the NASCAP targeting manual. And it's a, a, about a, um, an adult education case study. So this was the situation, um, a, a school district that had an adult education program, a high school equivalency program, uh, lost their funding. And so they asked the local community action agency if they would take over the program. And they said, okay, they would do that. And so they advertised, they thought they would, uh, they would get about 100 uh, students over time. And they, um, they looked, they did some research and they asked uh, uh, other program folks um, what sort of uh, success rate should we get? And so they set a target of 100 people uh, to be served and uh, 40 of those, 40% would get a high school diploma at the end of the program year. So they conducted their program. They, they did the best possible program they thought they could do. And at the end of the program year, the end of the first year analysis, what do you think they found? Did they meet their target or did they not meet their target? Well, they did not meet their target. They only had 13 people who got a high school diploma. So they were pretty upset and they didn't know what to do. So they did um, what the next step is, is to collect more data. You know, so you've got the data, you analyze the data, you have questions that come up. Why didn't we meet our target? And so they decided they would interview the students. So. They, they got the list of the students that didn't complete or didn't get their high school diploma and they called them and they talked to them and they asked them, they said, what was the problem? Why didn't you, well, they didn't quite say it that way, but they said, what were your challenges, your barriers? Uh, what could we have done to help you? Um, because they thought, well, maybe these students just weren't motivated. They, they, they didn't get their high school diploma because they weren't motivated. Well, they found out that wasn't the case. That the, that the individuals were motivated, they were excited to get a diploma, but that there were lots of other problems. They didn't feel they were making progress. They, they were uh, discouraged. And so the teachers went back and looked at what they were doing. They had decided that they were not gonna give grades. They felt that if they gave grades, uh, they gave someone a C rather than an A, that that would be discouraging. But, and so they only gave feedback. And, and so what the students told them was, we need to know if we're progressing or we're not progressing. The students also said that the time that the class was offered was inconvenient and that the location was inconvenient. So that's, that's what they had to decide now. What changes can we make? Because remember, data is for a purpose. And the purpose is making sure that you're doing the best possible job you can do. So they made some changes. And if we were in a situation where we could speak to you, we would ask you to tell us what kind of change did you think we could make? But for now, we're just gonna say, they decided they would have some new hours. They would devise a process of measuring progress that they could share in an individualized plan with each of the adult students. And that would give the students a knowledge of how they were progressing. They wouldn't have to use the A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, old school system, but they would have a measure of progress that was individualized. Uh, so they made those changes 
And um, unfortunately, we don't know how well they did. But that wouldn't that be the next step is, um, is to make sure that you followed up to find out what whether those changes actually did what you expected them to do. Um, Mia is asking about the peak graphic. It will be in the PowerPoint or the PDFs uh, of the slide deck that you'll be able to download. Okay. So now here's where we're going to spend some time discussing. And uh, we didn't realize that you wouldn't be able to speak. So we've asked Carrie to jump in and help us to do some analysis. And we'll ask you to put some ideas in the chat. Uh, Terry, would you send the PDF of the example handouts into the chat? Um, they're, I'm they're doing it. Now. Okay, we've got eight examples, and uh, we're just gonna we're gonna talk through them. We're gonna ask you to look at data elements and. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Connie. Um, we'll look at data elements and we'll we'll think about what story does it tell us. Okay, so we're going to look at the first one. So we found that in our report, we served uh, 40,000 individuals. This is a, a report, Dr. Uh, believe that this is a report from a local agency. So um, we served 40,000 individuals and and that and 16,000 households. So the first thing that we would want to know is, well, what's the size of the community in which the service delivery was being done? And so in this Southern County, which we made up, <laughs> um, that the residents that experienced poverty uh, were identified as 90,851 with 16,699 households. So I'll ask you to think, what, 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 back up, please. Okay. <laughs> but I, I wanted to think, of, think about some, what, what kinds of information might you be able to glean from this data if you analyzed it? What, anybody have something they wanted to put in the chat um, about this? Uh, they served 40,000 individuals out of 16,000 households, and the total number in poverty in the area was 90,000 and uh, 16,699 households. So Sarah oh. says the household served had lower than average household size. Okay. All right. And you found that by dividing a simple division process to say how many people would be in each of the households. What else did anybody see? People experiencing homelessness maybe aren't included in the household count. Oh, okay, we would wanna know more about that. The ratios between the population and household served. So Caitlin, are you saying that, uh, that there were 16,000 households served and 16,699 households in poverty. It seems like almost every per household in poverty got some service, uh, if this data is correct. So, Barbara, my, and Keith says in the chat too, number of families served and number of individuals served are not proportional. Yep, so a couple of folks. Have right, made. right, right. Okay, so go ahead, put some, some okay. of the bullets up. <laughs> Agency not counting other family members. Okay. All right. So about 94% of the households were served. So that's a question. Was that data accurate? Um, and then the number of individuals is only about 40% of the 5% of the number of families. Does that mean there's a high number of single person households being, being served? That could be a possible question. And is there another? I wanted to draw uh, attention to Larissa's comment. The number of households might be off. 16,000 households served and 16,900 in the total county. Is this data unduplicated? Right. Well, that wouldn't that be your first thought is that maybe that 16,000 served was not unduplicated. Uh, it, it seems unlikely that you would have served 94% of the households that were in need. So it could be the case but it, it, it raises a red flag. 
And then this last one, um, which you'll see on several of the slides, is there an agency need you can identify from this data? A lot of times we think about what, how we, we might uh, change the, uh, the program service delivery to improve outcomes for individuals and families. But part of that is what does the agency need to be able to make those kind of changes? So in this case, one agency need might be a way to verify unduplicated counts. I mean, that might be a, 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 an agency need that that's, uh, rises to the surface quickly. Okay, I think we have another one. Okay, so here's some data. Do you want to talk through this one or you want me to keep going? Uh, you want to keep going on this one and we'll start. Sure. So this up. is a different, uh, this is, there's a, a, a factor here where we're comparing last year's data with this year's data. And we see that this is the list of the uh, income uh, according to the CSBG annual report. And their first, they thought, wow, the number in the extremely low income category, the under 50% of the, uh, the poverty guideline increased dramatically. Look, it went from 135 in 2019 to 250 in 2022. What might that say to us? What kinds of thoughts might we have? This is hard with you having to put in the chat. The pandemic, Larissa says, the pandemic is going to have influence on a lot of things. And that, that yeah, that there are is an income change, limit change. Yeah, maybe the poverty guidelines weren't updated. Um, Oh, there, there, you could have just better captured the demographics. You know, that's always a possibility that that you um, that you're getting better numbers in 2022 because you've increased your process, your your data collection process. So, oh yeah, and another category went up too. 151 to 175 went up. Um, more people were utilizing the services. All right. The large growth in total customers, it's possible that most of the new were in the extremely low category. Good point, Sarah, you're making that comparison. You're comparing the total numbers went up too. So you're not just using that one line of data, but you're looking at it in the context of the whole agency service data. So the numbers went up and where they went up the most was in that very low, uh, extremely low income category. Okay. I don't know if there were others that we that I didn't see more. I people. think that was I think that was all, Barbara. Okay. All right, let's see what let's let's see what were some things that we put here. The poor are becoming poorer despite resources and services being available. This is particularly important during the pandemic period in this 19 to 22 period where there were so many services available there was such a high need that those services maybe just didn't go as far as they could. So the poor were actually uh, in greater need, maybe not poor, but, but in greater need uh, in, it, without, even because, even with there being more resources and services. So was it that they didn't know about other services, they knew about the community action. And so they came to community action because that was familiar to them. Um, so that, that would be something that you would wanna find out more about. And then did the root causes and characteristics of that population change? And how did that change? And then again, is there an agency need? Um, it, would there be an agency capacity need uh, that could help us more strategically serve this very low population. Okay, a couple more new messages. Numbers the highest. Okay, well, it, and, and I'll go to the next slide because that's really about the next one. I was really concerned about the change in the in the relationship of the uh, eligibility increase to 100% to of poverty, what impact that would have um, on agencies. And so in this case, 
there was an increase in these uh, higher income households. And that, as, as Larissa said, that could just be because uh, the eligibility changed. Um, and then maybe things just need to change because of the fact that those at the higher incomes are struggling as much as those at the lower, uh, lower level. Any thoughts about this higher income? The, the, the higher numbers in those, uh, those categories. Inflation, oh, the higher costs. You know, and we're hearing a lot about higher costs of uh, housing, you know, that that was causing people to have greater need for food supports. They don't normally consider themselves poor. Ah, but when you're in the face of a pandemic, you have a lot of issues um, that you have to that you have to deal with. Capturing the data, medical bills. Yeah, in the past they got they weren't. Yeah, the eligibility limit makes a huge difference, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah. Let's see what other things we have. Eligibility levels increased what are different needs. And then a question of the service delivery process, has it changed? Yep. And we're also seeing uh, increase in minimum wage, has increased household incomes, and then money received from COVID relief programs. All right, we just had some traffic here in my house. <laughs> So, um, so is was there a difference in the service delivery process? You know, we've been so focused on results for the past several years that when COVID came around and there was this, let's get the services out, get the services out, get the services out. Um, we were, we were a little shocked <laughs> as a network, and we're, we're thinking, you know, what, what are the service delivery processes? that had to change during this period to support these additional folks, uh, to, to support people with higher income. All right, let's see. Unfortunate deaths. Yep, that's a, that's a good one that, that happened. I'm sure that happened to a lot of people that families were finding themselves in need because they lost family members that were wage earners. Increases in minimum wage. Oh, COVID relief programs, right, right. So, um, so this question about what agency capacity is needed uh, to better identify and more strategically serve this population. So you see changes on both ends of the scale here in example two and example three. So uh, Carrie or Terry, any other thoughts about this example? to an example three where there's a big increase in the, um, the low end and in the high end. I think the comments have done a nice job of reflecting that it, it's not just uh, what happened on the family level, but it's also looking at what was the impact of a community event on the family and then also thinking about agency capacity. So even though this is, a, this is agency data about families, you're still able to hit all three of those main areas just in your analysis. Oh, here is that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <here is that. laughs> Good. Well, let's look at this. Let's look at this next one. And so, uh, in in examples two and three that were were connected the the discussion there was based on what we did see uh, in our data collection but sometimes our analysis needs to happen because of what we what we don't see uh, so think about that perspective so uh, here I'm going to pull up uh, quantitative data let me get my chart here there you go uh, shows that there was a high percent of children under the age of five years old uh, in families with low income. And the qualitative data show, uh, that was collected, you know, through those interviews, those focus groups, uh, surveys, didn't show a need for early childhood services. 
but the agency data shows that this agency in particular provides a significant number of early learning opportunities through Head Start. They serve a variety of communities across their service area. Um, so, so in this case, um, very few people actually said that there was a need for those early childhood kind of supports to meet families' needs. Um, why do you think that was? It was already being met by the agency. They were already getting it. Yeah, they yeah. knew about the service. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and yep. this is so important. Uh, it seems so obvious. But this is skipped in community needs assessments uh, across the country. They're, they'll say, uh, we have a large number of children age five uh, and below uh, in, this, in this community, uh, but, but there's no identified need anywhere. Uh, so, uh, so then when you put it in your plan, we're going to provide Head Start services. It's not backed up with your community assessment data. So you have to use that, those two kinds of data together. You have to be able to make those connections and, and show that there is a need and think about the reverse. If the service part of the community needs assessment of course is collecting data on needs and resources. And so if this resource that your agency just happens to provide, but maybe another agency provided it, if that resource went away, then all of a sudden would next year's survey data perhaps reveal more of those qualitative responses where this does become a need. So this, this kind of data could tell you that, this, that it is a need, it's currently being met, but without this service, the the need could could then then go. Uh, you know, think about that tipping point. You could go perhaps into a crisis situation. So, thinking again about your agency capacity needs here. Are you able to maintain meeting this need? Uh, oh, wow. Do the number of spots that you provide uh, match up with the need that's available in the community? Are the services you provide or that you're providing? through these, these Head Start uh, classrooms, are they, are, they, um, are they meeting the needs of the children in those communities? If, if by and large you find that, that the majority of children coming to one classroom don't speak English as their primary language, what is your agency capacity to be able to meet that need? So, so this is where we're starting to do some of that nuance, peeling back the onion. Uh, it's obvious if we can look at something and say, well, that doesn't look right. But sometimes we have to we have to do a little more uh, finessing to to put these pieces to put these pieces together. And and if you have a waiting list, that's also a very useful document. Yep. And I think I think Corey brings uh, brings up a good point. Whether we surveyed the target population or whether we were asking folks that don't need the service uh, if that service is needed. So. If our quantitative data shows that there's a high percentage of children under the age of five, but we talk to people like me, um, then, you know, I'm not going to be able to provide relevant information. Uh, so I think that, that that's a good point that, that Corey made as well. Absolutely. Who Thank we you. ask and what we ask them impacts the data that we then get. And that goes back to, is this the right data that we need? to make decisions. Yeah, if I surveyed, you know, not that you're 80 years old, Terry, if I surveyed 80 plus individuals yeah. and they all, you're not over 80 either, Barbara Mooney, and everyone <laughs> said, nope, we don't have this need. So we say, well, we're gonna get rid of this program because our survey respondents said we didn't need it. Oh gosh, then what, right? So yeah, it, it's exciting when you <laughs> when you think about uh, all the, the information you can glean. Uh, so let's look at this next one here. Uh, so here's uh, this one. And so um, when you consider the success of your programs beyond the original expectations. Um, so this is thinking about, uh, and maybe um, I don't think we can do a poll, but just think about, and you could even put in the chat, how do you use those success stories that your agency collects? Um, how do you use that, that qualitative success data beyond just, yeah, it makes us feel good, but do you use that data? Do you turn that in, into information uh, for decision making? So this is actually, uh, this is again uh, from a, a customer from an agency and they said, oh gosh, after enrolling my child in Head Start, 
I found out that there were services available for me. Um, I was able to take classes to prepare uh, to, to take the GED to get my high school diploma. Um, this sets a good example for my child and it shows that I value education. Um, so what kinds of decisions could having this kind of data help you make, uh, again, thinking in this vein of agency capacity, um, those kinds of things. How, how is this beyond just a feel good statement? How is this useful data? Um, you could do the annual report and your elevator speech. Oh, Matt, I love to hear that you're talking about elevator speeches. Yeah. I'll be with you next week and or the week after. And we're gonna talk about elevator speeches there too. Oh. Yep, and Larissa says grant application, staffing, partnerships. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did you know that it's not just the child that benefits? Did you know that that there's these other pieces too? Yeah. Good wraparound services. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, if you think about this whole uh, family approach to den approach that's so popular now, it really is head start model from you know 1964 mm -hmm. but head start didn't promote it didn't use its data very well to do outreach and so you know now we have a, a, a new language around whole gen uh, or two gen and whole family uh, that really is the head start process in place and Lori saying that, you know, using that to promote your program in the community. And yes, Sarah, I love this. It would be great to collect data to see if there are other Head Start parents are enrolled in services. Yes. So is this one or is this 100? And then what does that mean? Yeah. Um, right. Important. Current quote also, for grant proposal. Yeah. Go ahead, Terry. Mm -hmm. um, also, when we think about Head Start, I think sometimes there's an assumption that if our agency provides Head Start services uh, to say part of our, our service area. We forget about the other Head Start programs. So are we also reaching those Head Start families um, that are that have standalone uh, Head Start programs and early programs? Good, good. Yeah, because a lot of the Head Start programs that are in school districts don't have the wraparound services that the community action programs do. A great point. We can provide those linkages. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just thinking about you know those implications for agency capacity going forward. Again, is it one or one hundred? Is there opportunity for some um, interagency referral and support and leveraging uh, there and also in the community? Um, and is there an agency need that you could identify for this story or, or from this story rather? So just. What we may just see is, oh, that's something that feels really good. This could also be a really key part of that decision-making conversation. Barbara, do you want to do this next one? Sure. When something didn't happen the way you thought. <laughs> so uh, we, we actually planned, and this is what you should do absolutely every time that you're thinking about your annual report is you should be looking at what, how does this year compared to last year and how does my projection compare to my actual? So we thought we would serve 50 families uh, in our plan, but in our actual uh, report, we had served 54. Yay, we served more. But wow, what do you see there with the outcomes, the employment placements, only one, and we thought we would do 10. Only two moved out of poverty, and we thought what five would. Uh, only four got better employment, and we thought seven would. When you get that kind of data, people want to say, oh, maybe that data is not accurate. <laughs> but, you know, when you don't succeed, it's just like the adult ed example that we talked about earlier. When you don't succeed, what do you need to do? You need to gather more data. You need to have more uh, more information that's generated from your data collection and your analysis of that data. Um, because you're way off base in your predictions. And why is that? Was that because something happened in the world out there, like a pandemic maybe, <laughs> or something else? Like um, a pandemic maybe, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like a plant closing or some closing or something. Uh, the opportunities changed. Yes, thanks, Melissa. That's right. 
uh, things can change in the area and you know you just don't have the same opportunities that you thought you would have when you were doing your plan for this mm -hmm. um, and maybe uh, good point Sarah maybe the folks that are were enrolled are still working towards those outcomes and they'll meet those outcomes, just not in the time frame that was projected. Maybe people entered late into in the year because they were prevented from entering for some other reason. <laughs> and Melissa says staff and funding changed. Yep. This is where your trend data, you know, is this an anomaly? Or when you look back over the course of three or four years, do you see that there has been a steady decline? Or is this just a blip? You know, this is this is where that comparison of well, what happened before? Is this just some isolated event, or or is this a a, a, um, a symptom maybe that we're seeing of something bigger? Yeah. All good comments. Okay, here's our next one, and this is the complicated one. <laughs> when you have a lot of different things that you're trying to look at at the same time. Sometimes we see these kind of reports. Um, we're, we're looking at communication now. We're asking people to send us examples of communication that they use. And so sometimes we see something like this. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to like focus your, your brain and say, what are all these things? 61 obtained employment, 43 got a certificate or degree, uh, 36 got emergency services, 18 obtained housing and so on. Uh, and it says the total number served in the program, 170, but was it 170? Are you adding up all of the people who attained uh, uh, something in this uh, graphic or, 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 or were there more people served? So there's not a real clear indication of how many people were actually served in the program. And we always talk about the so what without anything to compare it to. Is 61 good? Well, if your target was 61, then sure. <laughs> but what if your what if your target was 161, right? So without context, sometimes it's hard to make sense of just isolated, isolated data points. And so the question about implications for agency capacity, one of the things that you would want to do is maybe clarify some of the elements on their report. Uh, you might want, want to say. Uh, somewhere on there, we served 170 uh, individuals or 130, 70 families or something, so that then those other numbers could be in context. And maybe not all 170 had an employment-related goal. So who who did? So you're you're starting to kind of piece out uh, some different elements here. Yeah. Oh, and I'm just seeing now that the 136 received employment support. And then 61 obtained uh, or improved employment. So could those two be put together in some way or should they be? <laughs> so that's part of, part of the question. Right, and is there any duplication in terms of received employment yeah. support? Does that include, yeah. um, you know, resume, assistance in developing a resume and some got, some of the 136 got that as well as you know, some assistance for tuition for a certification program, some got that. So you really have to real understand the, the uh, details of that particular data point. Yeah. Again, we, we make assumptions, right? We may assume if this is our data that everyone understands what we're trying to tell them, but think about your audience. Um, you know, There's gotta be some context there. Uh, so this is, we're getting close to our time, and this is our last example that we have is about uh, using um, um, data from a SWOT analysis, and I'm moving that off because I just saw the agency name was, was on that, but I guess, I guess that's okay because we've already sent the... We didn't send it out. Oh, yeah, okay. we did. Okay. Well, it doesn't say anything bad about the agency. No, no. So there, so SWOT analysis, right? So the general, yeah. So um, 
this is often done as part of a strategic planning process and a, a SWOT analysis is an excellent opportunity to collect data on your agency level needs. So again, sometimes this is just done as an isolated activity. It's a standalone check, we did a SWOT, but so what? What are you, what are you taking from the analysis of that data? So, you know, uh, we, we may see some strengths that could also be our challenges and some challenges that we know we can lean into our strengths to build on. Uh, so again, not just leaving this as raw data. This would be an example just of raw data. This is just a set, but you have to then start to make sense of it. How many said this? Did they also then say this? Um, are things in this area getting better? Are they getting worse? If you have SWOT data from the last time you did it, is anything different? Were the people that took it, uh, that completed the SWOT analysis different than the, than the time before? So, you know, with all of these examples, I think what we're, we're trying to just say is you can just start anywhere with just a sense of curiosity with any set of data. And we always talk about, you know, just starting small, Pick one thing that you just want to look at and see where that can take you and build your confidence in being able to make sense of all of this really rich data that you've been collecting um, and that you have available to you. Barbara, do you want to close this out? Uh, just to say thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we we just want you to, to make sure that you have the data that you need and that you can turn it into uh, information because you have control of your story. And the way you control it is by shaping your data the way that you want to. Um, just how, how well you, you do that uh, is part of the performance management framework. So um, let us know if there are things that you need to be able to move forward. And we are hoping that you have um, what you need to, to talk to other people, that you can use some of this, the um, material that we've shared to start discussions uh, at your own agency to think about uh, data analysis. So thank right. you, Terry. Thank you. We really appreciate your expertise. I wanna answer a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make a request. I've placed a link in the chat uh, for the webinar evaluation. So please, please, please uh, complete the evaluation. And yes, we will be posting a recording of this session and sharing the uh, PowerPoint slides as well as a link to the survey, uh, to the evaluation uh, following the session. So we appreciate everyone's time. I'm gonna take one more quick look and see if there are any other questions? I don't see anything else. So again, thank you all very much. And we'll hopefully see you next Wednesday at the next at the next Wednesday webinar. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.